Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's briefing. Before I start, uh, let me apologize to you that we are a little late. We've had some technical issues uh, that have meant that we couldn't start at 2.30 as originally planned. And some of those technical issues uh, will cause, has caused difficulties for journalists joining us, and I'll explain what we're going to do when we get to that part of this briefing. I want to start, though, as I always do, by updating you on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19 in Scotland. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 14,537 positive cases confirmed, an increase of 90 from yesterday. A total of 1,308 patients are in hospital with the virus, 1,007 who've been confirmed as having COVID, and 301 who are suspected of having COVID. That represents a total decline of 108 from yesterday, including a decrease of four in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 59 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is the same number as reported yesterday. I'm also able to confirm that today, since the 5th of March, a total of 3,354 patients who had tested positive for the virus have been able to leave hospital, and I wish them all well. Regrettably, I also have to report that in the last 24 hours, nine deaths have been registered of patients who have been confirmed through a test of having COVID-19. That takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,103. It's worth bearing in mind that fewer deaths tend to be registered at the weekend than on other days of the week. That is almost certainly part of the reason why today's figure is significantly lower than yesterday's. But as always, I want to stress that these numbers are much more than st statistics. They represent individuals whose loss is a source of grief to many. And I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. As Health Secretary, I also once again want to thank those working in our health and care sector. Thanks due to every single person, doctors, nurses, paramedics, care home staff, healthcare assistants, porters, cooks, cleaners, many more. Everything that you do is essential to the health and well-being of our country, and all of us owe you a huge debt of gratitude. I have three areas uh, where I want to update you on today. The first relates to care homes. All care workers demonstrate every day commitment and compassion in their work and in incredibly difficult circumstances. So we will continue to do everything we can to support you whilst you provide care and support for those who most need it. On Friday, we published detailed clinical and practice guidance for care homes. Today, we've published details of arrangements that take effect from tomorrow to ensure enhanced professional, clinical and care oversight. The publication today sets out a very clear role for NHS in partnership with the relevant local authority and local health and social care partnership to actively and proactively ensure that every care home has the additional support and, if necessary, intervention to make sure that clinical care, infection prevention and control, PPE and testing arrangements are what we need them to be. Accountability for this sits at the most senior levels of our health boards and, of course, through them to me as, as Health Secretary. These additional arrangements build on current support and ensure that care homes benefit from the vital contribution of nurse directors, chief social work officers, and chief officers of health and social care partnerships. The Scottish Government has also added new measures to the Coronavirus Bill, which will receive stage two consideration in Parliament next week. These make it clear that if a provider is unable to continue to deliver care, or if there is a significant risk to residents, Scottish ministers can ensure continuity of care and support. These powers would only be exercised as a last resort. 
There is a range of guidance available for care providers on how to manage the current situation, which we expect to be followed. Now, of course, there are many positive examples across Scotland of highly effective management of care homes. But there have also been instances where care standards during this pandemic have fallen short. We are already taking action to address these with the support of the Care Inspectorate. If passed, though, these new measures that we are proposing will provide additional assurance to staff, to people who live in care homes, to their residents, to families, that further action will be taken to address any failings that arise and will be taken quickly. The coronavirus prov bill provisions, together with the guidance we have published, reinforce our determination to ensure that care in every residential setting is as safe as possible. The second issue I want to talk about is a further development of our growing capacity to test, trace, isolate and support. That process, which involves identifying cases of COVID-19, finding the people they have been in close contact with, and then asking those close contacts to self-isolate for 14 days, is crucial as we start to emerge from the lockdown. It will help us to quickly break the chains of transmission and therefore stop any new outbreaks of COVID from growing. Currently, health boards across Scotland do some contact tracing based on risk assessments. And as part of our build-up of contact tracing staff, an open recruitment process is underway to supplement the increase in contact tracing teams boards are currently working on. We now have 600 additional staff across our NHS boards who are ready to start and more are being trained as contact tracers. From tomorrow, NHS Fife, NHS Lanarkshire and NHS Highland will test the contact tracing technology that health boards will use. This technology builds on existing tried and tested technology and is designed to support staff to collect and record information and to trace more contacts more quickly. Together with the growing number of contact tracers, the technology allows us to carry out contact tracing on the much larger scale that will be needed. The software, which is being tested next week, will be used in all health boards by the end of May and will continue to be refined and improved during June. It will play a valuable role in improving the speed and effectiveness of our work to test, trace, isolate and support. The final issue I want to update you on is the appointment of an additional Chief Medical Officer. The First Minister has appointed Prove Professor Marion Bain to the role of Deputy Chief Medical Officer on an interim basis. Professor Bain is the Scottish Government's former Senior Medical Advisor for Public Health Reform. Most recently, she has been working as the Director of Infection Prevention and Control in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. She is also an honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh and has a particular research expertise in the use of routine health information for public health and clinical research. Professor Bain will work alongside our other interim deputy CMO, Dr Nicola Steedman, and she, she will support our Chief Medical Officer, Dr Gregor Smith. Her appointment will provide additional capacity in that key role and further ensure that we benefit from the very best public health expertise available. I'm now going to pass you on to Fiona McQueen, our Chief Nursing Officer, but before I do, I'd like to emphasise once again our key public health guidance. Please stay at home except for essential purposes such as daily exercise or to buy essential items. You can now exercise more than once a day, but when you do leave the house, stay local, stay more than two metres apart from other people. And please do not meet up with people from households other than your own. You should wear a face covering if you're in a shop or in public transport, and physical distancing is difficult to achieve. And wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. Finally, if you are someone else in your household has symptoms of COVID-19, then you should stay at home completely. I do know how difficult these restrictions are, 
and I also know that they get harder as time passes. But they are necessary and they are making a difference. By staying at home, we, you, are slowing the spread of the virus, protecting the NHS and saving lives. And we're getting a bit closer to the day when we can relax some more of those restrictions. So, so thank you once again to all of you for doing the right thing and sticking to the guidance. I'll now pass you to Professor McQueen, our Chief Nursing Officer, and then to Professor Leach, our National Clinical Director. Cabinet Secretary, thank you. Today, I want to shine a light on the key role that district nurses and their teams play within that wider integrated health and social care team that delivers care day and night across our communities in people's homes. They work with key partners such as our, our general practitioners, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, as well as being incredibly well supported by the care at home staff and obviously in partnership with the local social work teams. They provide person-centred care to, to people with very complex needs and they, they support them to stay at home and prevent hospital admission, but are also there to welcome people back into their own homes when they've had a spell in hospital and, need, and, and then can be discharged. And they save many hospital admissions, they help people to stay in their own bed, nurse them within their home and where people can be surrounded by their loved ones, where they are going to be most comfortable and can recover and, and, and take up the challenge of their long-term condition where that exists. They support people with long-term conditions, they, they support patients and their families to talk through that anticipatory care, so what will happen in the future with them. The, and particularly at the moment with uh, this pandemic, they're providing routine and, and as well as urgent care for the whole community, but in particular for our, our patients who are shielded and can access routine health care the way they normally would. They also help provide support to residents in care homes, whether it's ongoing routine long-term condition management or palliative and end-of-life care. They have been central in the public health response to this pandemic, along with their GPs working at the forefront of what's happening in the community and through their clinical leadership across the health and social care teams have meant that our health, our health and social care services have been sustained. In particular, I'd like to highlight the examples of where we have district nursing teams wrapping around our, our care homes. They do that as a matter of routine, but in particular, they've been able to, to work in partnership, perhaps with our community mental health nurses, and provide advice and support for the care home staff in, in supporting people's more complex health care needs, and again, supporting our care home residents to be able to stay in their home where they have grown used to the staff and they've grown, grown used to the environment. They provide either direct hands-on care, but in particular, re more recent weeks, they've been providing infection prevention and control advice, ongoing education about PPE, as well as how to best support people who have a confusion or a dementia, perhaps who need to be socially distanced within that care home. They are incredibly well cited on what the needs of the community are. They, they know their, their local people, their local patients, and can travel that journey with them, whether it's from home into hospital or into a care home. And they also provide invaluable support to the unpaid carers, who again are providing real support to people at, in times of this pandemic. The, the district nurses have also been joined by additional staff who've, who've volunteered, but also by many of our students across the country. And these teams are providing outstanding care in quite difficult circumstances, providing person-centred, family-centred care. And I'm very grateful to them and would like to thank them for all that they do. Thank you very much, Linda. Jason. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. This afternoon, I'd like to speak about Scotland's incredibly valuable unpaid carers. I'm talking about anyone who's providing care to a family member or to a friend. Unpaid carers are not part of Scotland's formal volunteer or paid health and social care workforce, and many people juggle their caring responsibilities with work. Unpaid carers can be anyone. They could be a nine-year-old boy helping his mother with mental health issues. 
a 17-year-old girl looking after their sibling with physical disability, a 75-year-old man looking after his wife who can no longer walk, or children of elderly parents working to care for their parent or parents, ensuring they can continue to live at home where they want to. We think there are around 690,000 unpaid and young carers in Scotland. And during the coronavirus epidemic, it's likely these numbers will have increased. It is already an extremely pressurised job, and lockdown is simply adding to this pressure, both from a practical point of view and, of course, emotionally, as carers will be really worried about the person they care for, especially when they are clinically vulnerable. So to each and every one of you in unpaid caring roles today, I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you from all of us. We absolutely recognise and value what you do day in and day out. Without your support, our formal health and care systems would be simply overwhelmed. I wanted to draw attention to a few of the things we've put in place over the past few weeks to support you. We have extended access to PPE and testing to unpaid carers. We are proposing an additional payment to June's Carers Allowance Supplement Payment that will see around 83,000 carers receive an additional £230 to support them through this period and a £500,000 fund for local carer centres so that they can continue to support their local communities. And we are also extending eligibility for respite through the Short Breaks Fund and new opportuni opportunities for young carers through the Young Scott dedicated platform. You can find more advice on all of this for unpaid carers on gov.scot. The Scottish Government is genuinely listening to your voices and acting on your opinions and suggestions and will continue as we move into the process of transitioning out of lockdown. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, before I turn to uh, the journalists who've joined us, I need to say that we had eight journalists who were going to join us this afternoon. Uh, that technological, technical difficulty I explained about at the very outset, unfortunately, the platform that is being used for five of those journalists, they've not been able to come through, so we can neither see them nor hear them. What we have agreed is that the questions that they were going to ask, they will email those into us and we will answer them today. Uh, so my apologies uh, to those journalists. It's very regrettable and I know that many of our viewers want to hear what you've got to say as well. But we do have three journalists who uh, have joined us uh, and I want to go to the first one who is Emma Cameron from STV. Emma. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. When you published your Test Trace Isolate document at the beginning of this month, you said the work would be carried out by 2,000 contact tracers. 8,500 people have applied online. You say 600 are now ready to go. But why has this taken such a long time to get up and running? And when do we think the full 2,000 people will be recruited? Thanks very much, Emma. Uh, you're, of course, absolutely right that we estimate that 2,000 contact tracers will be the number that we need. Uh, those 600 uh, that I uh, spoke about in uh, my earlier part of the briefing are additional to the local health protection teams that exist in normal course. So that's the first group of additional NHS staff that our boards have identified, and there are more to come uh, the 600 are ready to go. That means that they've had the additional training that they need. Additional NHS staff uh, being identified now as we speak uh, will be getting trained as well uh, in the particular approach on contact tracing that we've outlined in that document that we published two weeks ago, in fact. And we said in that that there was, if you like, a threefold approach. We would increase the size of the local teams that currently exist using NHS staff being redeployed into that area. And that is what those 600 are as a start. We would also look to that bank of NHS returners who have not yet been deployed uh, to help in either uh, our hospital setting or in our care homes or in uh, social care uh, to see if any of those could also uh, become contact tracers. And we have at the same time, in order not to delay matters, run those uh, adverts uh, where we've had uh, over 8,000 expressions of interest. Now, in the latter two groups, we need to go through proper pre-employment checks and disclosure checks, as well as the training. All of that work is underway, and I am confident that we will get to that 2,000 number 
uh, through that threefold approach, but also through the helpful offers of others that we are now talking to, like uh, the St. Am St Andrew's First Aid Service. Uh, next is Derek Healy from The Courier. And the contact tracing pilot will build on existing technology already in place across the NHS. Are you able to say specifically, please, how many people in Scotland have been traced so far since the pandemic began? And should we expect any significant change in the daily figures during this two-week trial? So the, the uh, exact numbers of people who have been contact traced, uh, I don't have those figures with me. I'm going to uh, turn to Jason in a moment uh, for some additional uh, points he might want to make. Uh, we would need to gather that from our boards, I think, uh, but I'm very happy to look at whether or not we can do that and then provide you with that information. Uh, where you will see the numbers of people or the number of tests going through increase uh, in the coming weeks, as I think we have seen it in the past week, is as we uh, roll out and increase uh, the intensity of the work that we're doing to support, support care homes, where we are testing all residents and staff in care homes with an active case, uh, then moving to uh, linked homes, where uh, the home in question is part perhaps of a chain or a group, uh, as well as all the other areas where we've already set out how uh, testing eligibility works. So the, the contact tracing uh, app that is being tested in those three health board areas is the enhancement of the current digital uh, technology that we use for other infectious diseases, enhanced and focused on COVID. Uh, whether or not that will then produce an increased number of tests, we're testing the technology, not necessarily whether or not uh, it will increase the number of people uh, being uh, contacted and traced uh, as a consequence of that. But as we scale up, testing that technology now to make sure that it is effective and works is an absolutely critical thing for us to do. Jason. I, I would only add, Cabinet Secretary, that, that the nature of contact tracing is a clinical process. It is led by directors of public health in boards. They then have a series of staff, some administrative, some, cl some clinical, who, who do that process. The numbers of contacts depends on the behaviour of those who are the first case. So, so the number of contacts doesn't help us that much in knowing where the pandemic is or knowing the numbers of cases. What it does help us is, of course, in limiting those outbreaks. So you go from case one, you talk to the people who have been in contact with that individual by a definition, and then you deal with them. See if they have symptoms, self-isolate that group, and it, it goes from there. So if we have a low number in the country, there will be a low number of contacts. If we have a higher number in the country, there will be a larger level of contacts. So on, only at that level would the number of contacts help us. The, in normal times, the number of people you might be in touch with is in the region of 20 to 30 that you might have to contact. Just now, with lockdown, the, your number would be much less than that. If you think of the number of people you've been with for 15 minutes or more within two metres, that number should be relatively low if you're following the guidelines. Of course, as we move out of lockdown, which is the point of TTIS helping us to do that, that number will inevitably increase. But my first point, I think, is the most important. That this is a clinically-led clinical process to suppress the virus led by our public health professionals. Thank you very much. I, I understand Peter Smith uh, has managed to join us from uh, ITV News. So, Peter, are you there? Yes, I hope so, Cabinet Secretary. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Thank you very much and thank you for your team for accommodating me. Um, I just, in light of some of the headlines this morning about the, the Nike conference in late February, uh, there are some people who were working, for example, in a kilt shop in Edinburgh who said they came into close contact with people who were at that Nike conference. Um, they later developed symptoms. They say they were not contact traced. My understanding is they would have met the definition of being closer than two metres for 15 minutes. They said they were working with them for about half an hour. I just wonder if you can tell me why were they not contact traced? And how many people did you contact trace after that event? And a specific question, if, if I may, for, for Jason Leach, the, the National um, the Clinical Director. Um, 
we learned that obviously you and, and the Scottish government knew in early March um, that one delegate at that international conference had been capable of infecting one third of the whole room at that uh, Nike international conference. It was about two weeks later before we banned mass gatherings. In that time, we were still being told it was safe to attend mass gatherings. I know you said you were guided by the science. I'm just curious. I mean, I am not a scientist, but if one del one person with coronavirus can infect a third of the whole conference, that would tell me that there's a risk of going to mass gatherings, specifically things like music concerts. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, <clears throat> so let me deal with the first part of your question and then uh, uh, Jason can pick up on the second uh, and, of course, uh, add anything to the answer I'm about to give. So th there's a couple of important things that I need to say about this Nike conference. Uh, first of all, that all the proper clinically led standard protocols were covered and were followed. And the uh, incident management team that was convened to look at how that would be undertaken, uh, we reported, as you know, the first case not linked to that conference on Sunday the 1st of March. We were informed of two more cases as government on Tuesday the 3rd of March that evening and reported those cases first thing on the Wednesday morning with uh, uh, the normal reporting of cases. Uh, all of the normal standard uh, contact tracing approach uh, that we use then, we use now, and we will use as we continue, were followed. And essentially contact tracing uh, sits on the information that is given by the individual who is, if you like, the trigger case. So they are asked about where they've been, who they've been in contact with, against, as Jason said earlier, that case definition, which uh, if I'm right, I'm sure he'll correct me if I'm not, is being in contact with someone for 15 minutes or more within a distance of two metres. So knowing that and knowing where people have been, what they've told us, we, we then, or, or those clinical professionals in health protection, then go and trace those contacts and advise them to isolate, advise them that they have been in contact with someone who has uh, the symptoms uh, of coronavirus and they need to isolate and gives them the, give them the right healthcare advice about what to do if they develop symptoms themselves. Uh, and if they did, then we would then be tracing their contacts uh, over that period. So that, that was the approach that was taken. There, there was no uh, failure in the approach at all. But if we are not told by someone all the contacts that they have had, we cannot trace. We can only trace on the basis of what the trigger case says is here's what I've been doing, here's who I've been in touch with, here's where I've been over uh, the recent period. And from that, the contact tracers begin their work. Jason. I, th I think you've covered it, actually, Cabinet Secretary. The contact tracing process relies on information from the individual, from the, uh, from the first case, and then you move from there. So they are interviewed by experienced contact tracers. Remember, this wasn't a mass gathering. This was quite a small group of people who met internationally from lots of different countries. There was an international incident management team set up very quickly, in fact, and contact tracing done in a number of countries. This was, if you recall, some months ago at the delay phase, when we had very, very few cases in the country, very few cases across the whole of the UK. That was absolutely the right thing to do at that point in the pandemic. When that began to change and we saw a sustained community transmission and we couldn't work out where cases had come from, this one was clear where the case had come from. It had come from somebody who had traveled and our, all of our first cases were that, then we changed both the guidelines for the population and our ability to test, trace, and isolate. So we have moved that from a delay phase to a suppression phase, and now we're in a new phase, thinking about how we might come out of this lockdown into a new way of looking after this virus. And it, I'm sorry, but that's how it has to be. You have to follow the science and the viral spread as you go through each of these stages. Thanks very much. I, I understand Katrina Renton from the BBC has now joined us. Do we have Katrina? 
Good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Oh. Um, forgive me if you have already answered this question. Sorry, we've had technical difficulties at this end. And we just wanted to ask you about the strengthening commitment to care homes. The UK and English governments have committed to testing all residents in care homes. We spoke to Scottish Care on Politics Scotland this morning. They said that they need 100% of all residents and all staff in all care homes, regardless of whether there is a case of somebody showing symptoms or not in the care home to be tested. Will you commit to 100% testing in all Scottish care homes? Thanks very much, Katrina. As you know, uh, the current position is that uh, all uh, residents and staff in care homes with an active case uh, are being tested and should be tested. And part of the enhanced uh, measures that I set out earlier is to ensure that that clinical uh, and professional oversight is given to all of that work. Uh, in terms of care homes that do not have an active case, then at the moment the position is sample testing. But what I can say is that we are actively looking at whether or not the clinical advice that we receive uh, supports increasing that to testing all residents in all care homes and all staff in all care homes. And if that position changes, then we will, of course, advise uh, you through this briefing uh, of that. But more importantly, uh, we will ensure that that is implemented and that care homes themselves are advised of it. Thank you very much. And finally, I have Daniel Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just to follow up on Emma's question, um, could we please get a firm time frame for when you expect these uh, 2,000 additional contact tracers to be in place? And we, we found out today that the UK government is, uh, is apparently managed to hire 17,000. So I wonder if you might be able to explain that uh, disparity. And just also on the um, trial of the new app, um, does this mean that you won't be adopting the UK government's uh, contact tracing app, or is, is that still something that's under consideration? Thank you. So I, I can't speak for what NHS in England have done, and, and nor would you, I know, expect me to, or would they uh, welcome it, uh, just as I don't think they can speak for what we're doing. I have every confidence that we will reach that number of 2,000 by the end of this month, which is when we said we should have test, trace, isolate and support fully ready to go because it needs to uh, match uh, any easement of lockdown that uh, we may decide to take. Uh, it is a central component of continuing to control the virus and make sure that the progress that largely thanks to the public of Scotland we've achieved in suppressing the virus, that that progress isn't reversed. Now, uh, we are on track to do that. I've set out very clearly the threefold approach. We now have additional offers of support from uh, St Andrew's uh, First Aid, uh, which we are actively looking at. But, but we can't... People who come into the role of contact tracers or into the overall support programme for test, trace, isolate and support need to go through training. They first need to go through pre-employment checks, including PBG checks, which of course you would expect us to undertake uh, in order to ensure that those that they are in contact with have a degree of assurance of their personal safety uh, as well as anything else. So that work is underway. And uh, I think that we are well on train uh, to meet that requirement. It then needs to be flexed, of course, because you'll have heard uh, Jason's explanation about the number of cases, uh, in a way, uh, setting out the number or the amount of contact tracing that we need to do. So it is low at this point because the number of new cases is low because of lockdown. As we ease measures of lockdown, then uh, those numbers of cases may increase, and that is where test, trace, isolate, and support, if you like, comes into its own as a central tool that we have. So I, I don't believe there is a, a disparity in the approach between the four nations, and uh, what I am concerned about is our uh, delivery uh, of uh, that approach, and I believe that we are well on track to do that. In terms of the app, uh, we have said, it set it out very clearly in that strategy that we published a couple of weeks ago, that for us, the use of digital technology 
was to assist contact tracing. It was to assist those, if you like, boots on the ground and that we would use a digital piece of digital technology that was already tried and tested here in Scotland to contact trace on other infectious diseases. But we needed to uh, reposition it to be focused on COVID-19 and scale it up. So that technology is what is being uh, tested out in those three health boards that I spoke about earlier uh, to ensure that the scaling up of it and the focus of it uh, matches what we need. It will then be rolled out across all of our health boards by the end of this month, uh, obviously with any minor changes that are required as a result of this initial test incorporated. In terms of the UK government's proximity app, uh, we still are in discussions with them as to whether or not uh, we believe that it will be a useful addition to our strategy. It won't be the central uh, component of the strategy. We've set out what those are, what that is. Uh, but presuming that the information that it will supply will allow us to know where in Scotland that uh, UK app or NHS England app uh, will allow us to identify uh, those individuals and then feed them into our test, trace, isolate and approach, uh, then the app has potential as long as other concerns around confidentiality uh, and data control uh, are satisfied. We're still in those discussions with the UK government. Uh, as soon as we have concluded those one way or the other, then again, we'll make that clear to everybody as to whether or not that app will form an additional component to our overall approach. I don't know, Jason, if there's anything more you want to add? I, I, I don't think so. We need to know if it works and we need to know if it will add value. I think that's what the Cabinet Secretary has said. So if, if it works and add val adds value, then Scotland will be part of that process. But we do not need it to do contact tracing. We will be able to do contact tracing without it because we will have to. Thank you very much. That concludes uh, all our journalist questions this morning. So I'm pleased that uh, some others managed to join us. Uh, we uh, now have, uh, I think, two or possibly three journalists to send in questions to us. And as I've said, we will get those answers to you today. Uh, the final thing for me to say, though, is to thank uh, Jason and Fiona for joining me this afternoon, uh, to apologise to you again that we started late, to thank Robert, our sign language interpreter today, for his assistance. And most of all, though, to thank you, to thank you for continuing to stay at home, continuing to only go out for those essential purposes, for exercising locally, but as often as you want, for making sure that your household doesn't uh, meet up with another household uh, and mix with that other household, for continuing to follow those important hand hygiene messages. Because every day that you do that is a day where we are controlling the virus, protecting our health service, and indeed saving lives. And every day, brings us closer to the day when those numbers that are read out at the start of every daily briefing that are difficult to read and very difficult to hear continue to improve as they have been doing, where we move from a fragile position on that improvement to one that we can all be more confident on and we can begin to take those decisions that will ease the current situation. You are achieving that, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you.